It's your time, Mr. Bill. Thank you, Miss Sherry. God bless you. And this is Bill Kennison and Sherry. Good morning. My illustrious partner here. And we're coming to you live from beautiful San Antonio, Texas. And uh, it's, it's a pretty day today, Sherry. It's beautiful. It's been cool, but it's supposed to start warming up uh, today and this week. 75 today. Just at, uh, I still remember, and Maybe I didn't... tomorrow. And I didn't understand, be honest with you, I don't totally understand it now. But I'd go to these conventions, and whenever a preacher would get up from Texas, he'd say he was from God's country. And I never really... <laughs> I still, I still got to, I still don't understand where that came from. I'm sure someone will send us a, a message that's going to explain it to me. But Texas is beautiful. I love it here in Texas. And, uh, well, we had a birthday this week, Cherry. We did. Yes, we did. We celebrated. Our firstborn. Our only born. Oh, that, yeah, that, that's true. That's true. Our only born, Ginger, turned 40. Big 4-0. And you know what? She is beautiful. She don't look it. No, she sure doesn't look like it. And she is just beautiful. And we want to thank all of you that sent wishes to her. And in a couple of weeks, we have another birthday coming up. Oh, yeah, Sherry. Don't, don't, don't shake your head, no. You can't stop it. There's some things you cannot stop in life. Having birthdays is one of them. Good morning, Mike Boyle. <laughs> Mike Smith. <laughs> Good morning, Mike Boyle. Good morning, Mike Joe Sumter. And the Joe. The Joe's always with us. Yes. Happy Sunday, he said. It is a happy Sunday. It's a beautiful Sunday. John Lutz says good morning. And good morning to John and his family. You know what? I don't know why I love some of these grandchildren of other people so much, but if you ever see Jace... John Lutz's uh, grandson. You can't help but love this kid. Christopher Kyer says, good morning. Whoa. He's been busy. He's he's off a ship and off of... Well, let me make sure I look all right. <laughs> Chris is out there. And it's good to have Chris. And love Chris. Jack Friedman says to like the um, YouTube page and the Gospel According to Kennison. All right. Please do that. Phoenix Benjamin, hello, good morning, Jeff McLaughlin. Jeff and Phoenix both. Chris Kyer says he's been traveling the world. Yes, he has. Sherry, I don't know why he says has, because he does it all the time. <laughs> well, he's... He is a world traveler. Yes, he is. He loves to travel. But I'll tell you one thing I love, and I'm going to make a special trip to California this Christmas time, which is quite a ways off. He's what do you not have, head? He's not having a store this year. He's only going to do it online. But but going in the store was the, was half the fun. He's last. He says he's laughing. All right, Don Moore, good morning. And Don and Cheryl always on vacation. Sharon Stein, good morning. And Sharon Stein. And Misty says I want to say Sharon Oregon too. Well, just a second here. Uh, I want to tell Sharon. I want to congratulate her. She did a great job. Uh -huh. As the president of the Republican Women uh, there in Southern California. And uh, I guess her term is up and like they should be in Congress. I forget how many people in Congress are senators and representatives that are over 80 years old. It was, an, uh, it was you know, astounding, the, per the percentage. I want term limits and age limits for all of our politicians. Okay, well, let me tell you something. No, they want to sit there and get rich on us. No. Oh, well, they've done pretty good. Yeah, well, it's term limits. But let me tell you something. They're not going to vote for them not to have a job. Well, they they need term limits <laughs> and age limits. <laughs> we need to send you to Congress. You could be there with uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and all the rest of it uh, that stir up trouble, I guess. Christopher Kyer, see, he agrees with me. Yes, term limits I, I totally all. agree, but they're, they're not going to vote for that. No. They're never going to vote for that. William Morris. Well, you know what? You have, you have a way to, to handle term, uh, the length of their term. Oh. Vote them out. Well. You want, to, you want to get rid of these old people? There's too many of them. I don't like old people. Uh, I, well. No, I don't say it, Sherry. <laughs> don't you say it. 
I'm just me. I, I don't, I'm ageless. I just, I'm just me. I'm just me. And uh, let's see, we got any other? A lot of unspoken requests. Well, I know that, but I was trying to think of, uh, anyway, uh, it's been a great week. And uh, I think you're, oh, you weren't even here last Sunday. No, they, the Ginger's friends in San Antonio were having her a pink party. Sherry. A pink birthday party. Now, if I'm not mistaken, aren't we getting ready for another birthday party for Ginger? Devin's having her a big party on the 25th. That will be her third p birthday party. Not really. That's her second. <clears throat> we just went out to dinner for her birthday party. Oh, birthday. okay. All nice. right. Just All right. Nice. Anyway, that their get-together and... Uh, uh, they're, they're, we're, we're very fortunate with the son-in-law we have and the daughter and the grandchildren we have. Birthdays are to be celebrated as long as you want to celebrate them, and as much. I don't even want anyone to know that mine's on New Year's, so I have no choice. Chris Kyrie has one coming up May 9th. Yeah, he's going to be 39 again. And him and Scarlett are a day apart. You know, I don't know, I don't know how old Chris really is, but I'm going to tell you one thing. The and, and there's nobody that has argued with each other as viciously as he and I have. But, Sherry, he is a good-looking guy. I don't know what his real age is, but he looks much, much younger and acts younger than I'm sure he really is. That's because he travels the world. He yeah, he's, he's a world traveler. He's grown up in theater. You know, he's a Peter Pan. He'll never grow up. Also, you're leaving out that uh, for uh, P.T. Barnum, he was their ringmaster. Yes. Their ringmaster. And wrote a book that actually he signed and gave to me uh, about his time as the ringmaster. Good morning, Mary Zastro, Kimberly Eisenberg. Love both of them, and I love Misty. And it is, you know, I'll, I'll agree with her part way. She said up there in Oregon. I, the only place that rains more than, than Oregon is Washington. Seattle. But Portland is a beautiful Beautiful, beautiful city. It really is. All right. Well, you got more there. No, I'm just laughing at Chris. He's making all kinds oh. of trouble. But does he know everybody else can see that too? Yes. He says he teaches kids. That's what keeps him young. And he'll never grow up out of that body. I Well, he's always been like me. We both said we may get old, but we're not growing up. And I'm not growing up. Phoenix Benjamin said he's 52 going on 27. Who, Big Phoenix? Phoenix, uh-huh. Yeah, I still want to get a tattoo from him. I, you know what? One day we're going to buy us a motorhome. We're just going to travel around, and I'm going to get tattoos from the people that love me, and, and I'm going to visit them, and they're going to be like, when's he going home? And I'm going to go, my home's out there on four wheels right there. Mm -hmm. How many home motorhomes have we owned? I think two. <clears throat> I think three. Okay. Had the executive, then we bought uh, one we only owned for a couple weeks, and the Limelands bought it, and I bought another one. Oh, okay. Then three. So that's three. I think that might be it. He said to bring Scarlett on our travel so he can see her. I would love to, but... Well, we'd all <clears throat> love to take Scarlett with us. You know, there's... She's a beautiful, beautiful little girl. Well, she's growing up. She thinks she's much older than 10, that she really is. But... Chris says, okay, we should let you preach. Yes, we need to. We need to. I had someone, and I'm going to, if I have a title today, they're telling you lies about God. They're telling you lies and have about God. I had someone send me a message after watching our program, and, uh, and I wrote it down, so I'll read it to you word for word, for word. You made a few good points, but the message seems one-sided. You go on about Abba, Jesus, radical grace, compassion, and the furious love of God, but you say little about morality. Okay, if I understand this correctly, what this individual is, is telling me is, is I, I should be up here telling you, don't do this, don't do that, and all the don'ts, and I should condemn you, and I should... And I, and I should just ride hurt over you like, like religion does. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I don't believe that. I believe they're lying about God. I do tell you about grace. I do tell you about love. 
And uh, you see, the Bible is a love story. And it's a love story of God with his people. Some of you would enjoy probably reading the Bible if you looked at it in a different perspective. God calls, God pursues, God forgives, and God heals. That's what God does. God is enamored with his people and so intent upon a response that he even provides the grace to respond. Now remember what grace is. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Other words, there's nothing you can do to, to get the grace of God. It is unmerited. You can pray all you want. And by the way, I want to bring this up. I just heard this this week. Asbury College in uh, a little town, I don't remember the town, but in Kentucky, I guess two or three weeks ago, uh, I think it might be, I don't know what kind of school it is, but they have a chapel. And they went in and they and they started praying. They have they have been in church twenty four hours a day for the last two or three weeks, just worshiping, praising. From what I understand, there's not even anyone preaching. They're singing. They're, and people are flying in from around the country and around the world to be part of that. That movement. You see, God gives us grace and God bless them on that. You see, God, the love of God, and put it real simply, the love of God is simply unimaginable. You can't imagine it. All you can do is receive it. But you can't imagine the love of God. We need to let go of impoverished, circumscribed, and finite, other words, finite, little finite perceptions of God. He's much bigger. We can't even, we can't even ex imagine how, how big God is. You see, the, the love of Christ is beyond all knowledge. You, there's no way to write down, and I know it, probably love has been written more about than anything else. But the love of Christ is, is beyond all knowledge, beyond anything we can intellectualize, beyond anything that we could imagine. Doesn't it sound like an easy religion? Sure sounds that way when I teach it anyway. But love has its own demands. It weighs and counts nothing, but expects everything. I hope you all are really paying attention to what I say the way I'm saying it this morning. I'll repeat that. It weighs and counts nothing but expects everything. Perhaps that explains our reluctant, reluctance to risks. I found out that church people are probably the worst risk takers you're ever going to find. We know only too well that the gospel of grace is an irresistible call to love the same way. Other words, we are striving to love as God loves. No wonder so many of us elect to surrender our souls to rules rather than to live in union with Love. We'd rather we'd rather have all kinds of rules to live by. Some people, their life is based on rules, and their spiritual life is based <coughs> on rules. And you see, no greater sinners exist. Now I listen to this, and then I'm I, I, like I said, I speak more about. Christianity, because that's what I was raised in. But you can put whatever you want in there. Mormonism, 
uh, Judaism, Buddhism. Uh, you, can, you can put them all in there. No greater sinners exist than those so-called Christians who disfigure the face of God, mutilate the gospel of grace, and intimidate others through fear. Now that, my friends, is religion. That is religion. They dis disfigure what God really is like. They mutilate the gospel of grace. They'll say it, but they do not practice it. They do not, they do not believe in it. And then they'll intimidate you. When everything else fails, they will intimidate you with fear. With fear. You know I'm telling you the truth. I like Eugene Peterson's forceful phrase. And it's kind of where we got our title this morning. And it says, they are telling lies about God. And then he says, and let them be cursed. Well, I'm not going to curse anybody. But they are telling us lies. You may go to church every morning and sit on that, or every Sunday and sit on that church pew, and that preacher's telling you lies about God. Mary Magdalene, she stands as a witness to the gospel of Jesus. On Good Friday, I want you to imagine this. On Good Friday... She watched as the man she loved got blown away in the most brutal and dehumanizing fashion that I know of. And we've mentioned on here a few times how what the crucifixion was like. She stood there and watched, and she loved this man. She loved this man. The focus of her attention, however, was not suffering. But the suffering of Christ, and in Galatians says, who loved me and gave himself for me. Never allow these words to be interpreted as an allegory in the life of Mary Magdalene. The love of Jesus was a burning and divine reality to her. She would have buried, she would have been buried in history as some unknown hooker, save for her encounter with Jesus the man. She would have just been another hooker that filled up a, a spot. Now, I want you to listen to this. She has no understanding of God. Some of you feel like you gotta, you got to get spiritual enough. No, no, no. Just as you are. We kept telling you last week. He doesn't love me. Uh, he doesn't love me for what I'm going to be. He loves me as I am. My faults, everything else. He loves me as I am. So we got Mary, known to be a prostitute. She has no understanding of God. She has no understanding of church. No understanding of religion or prayer or ministry except in the terms of this man. This man, Jesus, who loved her and delivered himself up for her, including everyone else. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a little cough still from my battle of COVID, but I came out victorious. Now, what do you got? I got a napkin for you. Oh, oh, okay. Here, I thought you had brought me a request right in the middle of my program. You see... The unique place that Mary Magdalene occupies in the history of discipleship owes not to her mysterious love for this man, for this love for Jesus, 
but to the miraculous transformation that his love wrought in her life. She simply let herself be loved. I want to ask you this morning, just allow yourself to be loved. Don't think about you don't deserve it. Don't think about the bad things that you've done. Maybe you're still doing. Just think about letting yourself be simply loved by God. I've done things in my life that I'm not proud of, but he loved me. I've been in fights in my life more than I can remember. But God loved me. I've lied. I've stolen in my life, but he still loved me. All I have to give him is simply love me. I will, I will give you me to love. That's all. I just simply let myself be loved by God. Man, that's so good. You see, the central truth, <coughs> the central truth for which Mary's life has come to stand is that it is possible to be delivered through love from the lowest depths to the shining heights where God dwelleth. One place it said where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. Now I may not be like some of you, or you some of you I may be like. I probably spent my youth hating, angry. I hated God. I hated church. I think I hated God probably more than I hated church. Hated him. I can remember times when I was an idiot. And I'd be there with my friends hanging out and drinking and doing whatever we wanted to do. Of course, drugs was way too early then for us. But I remember I'd get out in the street and go, you know, if there's a God, strike me dead right here. At least, at least my friends will know you're there. I was filled with anger. Filled with love. I mean, filled with with hatred, but where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, no matter what you do, no matter what you've done. His grace is sufficient for you. I'll never forget Paul writing. He said, I have this thorn in the flesh. In other words, something he considered sinful. Now, preachers have went on off all kinds of stuff of what they think his thorn in the flesh was, nobody knows. It's not our business. But no one knows. But he asked God, he said, three times to remove this thorn out of my flesh. Remove the desire I had to do that. Remove the, the strength that those habits and sins have on me. And he, nobody said it three times. God answered him and said, My grace, woo! My grace is sufficient. I've got goosebumps right now, honey. God's grace is sufficient. I want to repeat it again. God's grace, woo! Is sufficient. Whatever you've done, I'm not making an altar call here because I believe you're already a child of God. So don't let these other things bog you down. Just remember, whatever you do, you're not proud of His grace. <laughs> Woo! Is sufficient. Somebody said, well, you're getting excited about it. I can't help it. I can't help it. It excites me. You see, um, when, we're, when we're talking about these kind of things, when we're talking about how it changes lives. When Jesus asked Peter on the Tiberian seashore, Simon, son of John, 
Do you love me? That was all. And probably came out of the blue. John, Simon, son of John. He had he'd about changed his name, by the way. Do you love me? He added nothing else. What he said was enough. Do you love me? Do you love me? Can you allow my love to touch you in your weakness and set you free and empower you there? Can you do that? Just allow my love. Do you love me? Thereafter, the only power, and he had a new name. His name was called Peter. Thereafter, the only power that Peter had was Jesus loved him. The love Jesus had for him was the only power he had. When he proclaimed the gospel of grace, he preached it from weakness rather than power. Jesus told him, upon this rock, I will build my church. And he called Peter a rock. Yet when you look at Peter's life up to the crucifixion, he was anything but a rock. Matter of fact, when they had the Last Supper, and Jesus told him, before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me tonight, Peter. And remember what Peter said? No. No. It's already three minutes to go. Peter said, no, I'll never deny you. You know what? Before midnight, after they had arrested Jesus and he seen what was going to happen, all of a sudden he wasn't in the rock anymore. All of a sudden, he was just a weak person that he'd always been. But after Jesus died and resurrected from the dead, Peter became a rock. So much so that when it come time and they crucified Peter, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Crucify me upside down. I don't deserve to hang the way Jesus hung. And they did. They hung him upside down on that cross. He told and retold the story of his, unknown, of his own unfaithfulness and how Jesus touched him. When he proclaimed the gospel of grace, he preached it from weakness and power in God. That is what converted the Roman world and what will convert us and the people around us. If they see the love of Christ has touched us, we need to join Mary Magdalene and Peter in witnessing that, that God is not primarily a moral code but a grace-laden mystery. It is not essentially a, a philosophy of love, but it's a love affair with you. It is not keeping with rules with clenched fists, but receiving a gift in open hands. True spirituality consists of living moment to moment by the grace of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you I thank you for giving us the opportunity to bring this message and let it become life to everyone hearing us. If we could just understand that love will completely transform our life. It'll make us well when we're sick. It'll make us rich when we're poor. It'll cause us joy when we're unhappy. And I ask that you extend that to every person that's watching our program this morning. Now give you all the praise. Amen. Well, Sherry? So good to see Jennifer Matthews on here this morning. I love Jennifer. Yes, it's She's so fought awesome. her share of battles, I'm going to tell you. Yes, she has. But one of the most loving people I've ever met, I think. And beautiful. But just one of the most loving people I've ever met. And she said yes. Anthony Goldman says amen. Amen, Anthony. I agree with that. Kimberly Eisenberg says amen. And Misty says have a great week. I'm going to. And Don and Cheryl are back in their home. The Morins, they're back in their home. 
and they're on the way to the races. Today. Okay, well, mm -hmm. you know, when you say back in their home, they had that home completely redone. Yeah, they had to. Well, regardless if they had to. <laughs> These people go on vacations, and they come home, they got a whole different home. I'm telling you, yeah. I, I got to change my life. I got to change my life. I got to do like Chris and, and Don and, and Cheryl. Yeah. And they have a bedroom waiting for us whenever we Well, leave. God knows we used it the last time. <laughs> Have a great week. Sharon they were great hosts. And we love all of you. I love you. Sherry loves you. God loves you. And God bless America. See you next Sunday. Have a great week.